if you have patients who are in unconscious state, that is that they have no voluntary action in the brain happening, only have involuntary brain activity. So they, there is no way they could consciously manipulate their subjective experience. Therefore, this makes near-death experience a really great model to understand neural correlates of consciousness. Jimo, people use near-death experiences, out-of-the-body experiences to inform theories of consciousness, uh, many different theories of consciousness, and some would use these uh, experiences, which nobody can, can deny they are, but to um, create an environment that they believe uh, consciousness has some non-physical aspects to it. From your work on near-death experiences, which involves some really excellent studies on the cascade of neurotransmitter chemicals that explode during the dying process, that uh, dopamine gives a sense of, uh, of uh, empathy and warmth, uh, uh, norepinephrine activity, and um, what can you infer in terms of the uh, of, of the use of near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences to inform theories of consciousness? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think that, uh, to me, I think the consciousness everywhere with us, okay, uh, can be separated into overt consciousness and covert consciousness. Overt consciousness is very easy to see because they're uh, expressed as a behavior, if somebody's standing upright or talking, you know they are conscious. We don't know their content of consciousness. We don't know what they're thinking, theorizing in their mind, but we know their consciousness. No surgeons who dare to put you under knife <laughs> when you're walking and talking and standing up. Yeah. So that's for sure. We know they're so. If you're uh, displaying any kind of voluntary brain activities, okay, then you are overtly conscious. Now, medicine's concerned with those that are covertly conscious people that are especially relevant for surgery. They don't want you to be able to sense the pain. So covert consciousness is, is difficult to study, which is what anesthesiology just all care about. Now we know, since we learned about the near-death experiences, we know, we understand those are subjective experience. We, no one denies that's consciousness, but uh, we know that's also covert consciousness. And uh, David Chalmer uh, famously said that a, a subjective experience is a hard problem of consciousness. And I think it's hard in the sense that if, if you're awake, okay, to figure out what in your head, okay, from third person point of view, must be hard because any kind of subjective experience you may have, you have to be conveyed to me through your language, which is a, uh, can be subjected to manipulation, misleading, uh, misunderstanding. So anytime when you use voluntary action of your brain, okay, that subjective experience can be misunderstood, misled. But if you have patients who are in unconscious state, that is that they have no voluntary action in the brain happening, only have involuntary brain activity. So they, there's no way they could consciously manipulate their subjective experience. Therefore, this makes near-death experience, a really great model to understand neural correlates of consciousness. We call it neural correlates of covert consciousness because this happens to somebody in a comatose state and didn't, shouldn't even have any kind of brain activity going on. But I think after we study the neural signatures of a covert consciousness, you know, how do we sense, how, why do we feel overwhelming positive pleasure, why do I feel super alert? Why do I feel I have, I'm floating in the air? Why do I see light even though I know my eyes are shut? I shouldn't be seeing. Why do I hear somebody's conversation when I'm comatose? So if we know the neural basis of these subjective experience, we can use the same or same kind of knowledge to then study as somebody who is fully awake, fully con overtly conscious, to understand their subjective experience. So I think that in a way, neural, neural correlates consciousness 
in comatose patients, which is a, called near-death experience, is a really great model to understand uh, uh, neural basis consciousness. Mm. And based on your work, it would seem to indicate a very much a brain-based um, theory. I yes. mean, you, you, you don't necessarily need to have all the pathways and which of the various competing neurobiological models are the generator of consciousness, but you're contributing that the substrate is neurobiological. Yes, yes. In fact, you, you probably know many of the theories that I, I know you're going to give a talk this afternoon about all of the <laughs> long list of uh, uh, models and theory of consciousness. I'm really looking forward to it. But uh, it appears, at least for the near-death consciousness, is concerned not only the posterior part of the brain is involved, which is uh, the hot zone, uh, PTO junctions, the frontal brain is also involved. There is an inter-hemispheric interaction between the posterior hot zone with the frontal part of the brain. So there's integration of new memory, perhaps new memory formation and memory recall. All of these are involved, not just posterior region, but it's also frontal part of the brain. So I think it's, it's, it's clearly, it's not everywhere, like in the animal models, but it's uh, in the select part of the brain that details still remain to be studied. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing. Closer to Truth is now accepting your tax-exempt donations. Please come to closertotruth.com forward slash donate. Thank you very much for supporting us and thanks for watching.